I offer these words in the name of the triune God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Good morning. So it just so happens that today we have a reading from the book of Acts about a baptism on this very Sunday that we have two baptisms this morning. Layton, who is the four-month-old daughter of Katie McKagan, now Patch, and her husband Kyle, who were married by Father Jim back in August of 2020. And so the Holy Spirit has moved them to come back to Augusta from Charleston, where they now live, to have their daughter baptized with us. We're so glad to have them and their families and their friends here with us this morning. And Ailish is here with her mother and her grandmother to make her commitment to the church. Father Thomas and I have been talking about Ailish, saying the Holy Spirit is all over her, and she just can't seem to get her off. She's jumped right in, and she's found her place in our outreach ministries and teaching Bible study with the Daughters of the King sessions and studying hard to learn what it means to be an Episcopalian. Most certainly, the Holy Spirit has been blowing about doing great things. Our readings today speak to the power of the Holy Spirit as an agent in our lives and how then that powerful influence plays out in the community of the church and in the church into our surrounding community. I love the story from our reading from the Acts of the Apostles, and I'm repeating the full name of that because I think it really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, as it is the Holy Spirit that makes things happen throughout all of its chapters. This morning, we are reading from chapter 8, but if we go back to previous chapters, the Holy Spirit has been busy calling, pushing, compelling people to do things out of their comfort zone. From the start in Acts chapter 1, the reader is reminded that the ministry of Jesus while he was on earth was carried out through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Acts of the Apostles as they are continuing Acts uh, by Jesus, facilitated by that Spirit. Throughout the Acts, we are reference, there are references to the promise, the gift, the outpouring, the baptism, fullness, power, witness, and guidance, all of the Holy Spirit. It would be impossible to explain the progression of the gospel apart from the works of the Spirit, for it was the Spirit which made it possible for the believers to perform the ministry they did and to have the protection necessary to not be immediately wiped out and provided the miraculous confirmations of the words of the gospel. We can look at the role of the Spirit in Acts and in the early church in many ways, And I always like to refer to the Holy Spirit in the feminine because I think the Holy Spirit is the feminine side of God. She is the light on the road to Damascus that blinded Saul. She is a power that then healed Saul's blindness, and they took on the name at that time of Paul. Acts chapter 2, we see the sign of the mighty wind that filled the upper room and tongues as a fire that rested on the apostles together with the women, Mary, and the disciples as they were filled with the Holy Spirit an act that we will celebrate soon on Pentecost Sunday. And in the chapter before today's readings, we remember Stephen as he enraged, uh, uh, enraged the Sanhedrin with all of the words of his strong faith, full of the Spirit, as they stoned him, and he looked up to heaven, and he saw the glory of God. The Holy Spirit continues to work in the Gospels where we read of Elizabeth being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing her to witness to Mary, blessed are you among women. And of course, this morning, we hear about Philip, a man filled with the Holy Spirit, doing many signs and wonders. He was one of those who was scattered because of the persecution that arose in the church. And he went to Samaria proclaiming Christ, and he did many miracles. And he brought much joy to the city, and they were believed, and they were baptized. Now, I could go on and on telling stories recorded in Scripture of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, experiencing extraordinary things, all led by the breath of God. All of these examples demonstrate to us that the Holy Spirit is both an agent of movement and a producer of the means required then to be moved. In our first reading this morning, an Ethiopian eunuch is returning home from worshiping in Jerusalem on a wilderness road, by the way. You know how much I love that. It's a metaphor for those who are seekers. And it must have been a moving experience in the temple because he is reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And it was at that time that the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go over to the stranger in the chariot and to help him. 
Get up and go, is what we heard. It's what Philip was told. Not tomorrow, not next month, but right now. And so, without any kind of argument, he got up and he went. And when God tells us to go up, to get up and go, we'd better do it. And this is why. Because we have an example of this person who was searching, this Ethiopian. He was open to what the scriptures had to teach him. He was a God-fearer, not yet a convert. Philip does not know what's going on, but you know God does, giving Philip the opportunity to proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ. Philip tells him about Jesus, and he must have also said something about life begins with baptism, but he doesn't make an offer to baptize him. It is the Ethiopian who, when he saw water on that spot, he said, I want to be baptized. And down to the water they went, and it was most certainly a sacramental moment. I wonder, what if, what if Philip had made excuses instead of answering that call to act? What if he had questioned what he was feeling um, and being called to do? I wonder if he thought, well, did I hear a voice speak to me? Am I really being propelled to go to this stranger and share my story about Jesus Christ to a man who's not even from here? He's not one of us. But notice, he did not hesitate. He did not worry how the man would respond. He trusted the voice telling him, get up and go. And so he did. And his response changed that stranger's life forever. One of the things that I love about the Episcopal Church is her openness to loving all people. We are followers of Christ, which means that we see God in all people. And so that means that our doors are open to everyone and that we then invite all to become a part of our family, to become a part of our community. Like Philip, we are sent out to invite everyone to hear the good news and to have a seat at the table of the Lord. It is this kind of love and acceptance that brings so many to St. Augustine's, and I think it's this love and acceptance that keeps them here. Now, I heard a story from a friend about a small church in Germany that in its courtyard had the statue of Jesus that was reflected of the text, Come unto me. As the statue had its arms reached out in welcome. But sadly, during World War II, the church building suffered damage from being bombed, as did the statue. And in that, his arms were broken off. Now, during the 50s and the early 60s, church members worked steadily to repair the church and the fellowship hall, but the statue, it remained broken in the courtyard. Finally, they got around to having a congregational meeting. You know, we have to have meetings to make any kind of decision, right? And so they met about what they were going to do about this armless statue, whether to replace it or to mend it, they didn't know. And it was during this meeting, one fellow stood up and he said, you know, I've been a part of this church all my life. And after the war ended and we returned to worship, I lamented for the first five or ten years over this statue being broken. I really loved that statue. But over the years, I have come to realize that it is an important symbol for me and for all of us that Christ has no arms with which to love and to hug the world except through ours. And he said we should leave it as it is. And they did. Our epistle reading from the first letter of John explains this kind of unconditional, accepting, all-reaching love. He uses the ancient Greek word agape to explain the connectivity of the community of the church, familial affection without any romantic or sexual connotation, close-knit people to whom you not only owe that, but also feel that connectivity too, a love that overlooks oddity, a love that overlooks conflict, that overlooks difference. Living an unconditional and accepting love that God has for us and calls us each to have for each other. Because God is the source of all love. And as long as we abide in God and God abides in us, God's love flows through us to one another and then it comes right back. God is the source of love and the essence of love and he loves us through that. And it is the Holy Spirit then that reminds us of this, of this connection and is then the impetus to open our arms to others, to all others. But our gospel reading from John, it reminds us that our own brokenness, our own humanity may get in the way of this agape love that Jesus teaches us and the Holy Spirit guides us. 
We need to spend time with the Spirit to be sure that our judgments or even our tolerances that we can easily fall into, tolerances with condition that can get in the way of helping others to have that experience of the kingdom like we do. Like Philip, like the Egyptian, like the Gentiles of the Old Testaments, and like many of our neighbors. And so John tells us that these barriers, well, they may need to be pruned or trimmed from our lives so that we too can continue to be fruitful. Now, this may be painful. It, it takes a lot to look at ourselves to see what may be getting in the way of our being witness, of our being able to share the unconditional love of God, and to be able to invite all, all into our community. Because we understand that inclusion isn't just inviting someone to sit at our table. It is believing that they belong there. The image of community that emerges from John then is one of interrelationship, mutuality, and dwelling. To get the full sense of this interrelationship, it is helpful to visualize what the branches of the vine that Jesus speaks of, what they look like. In a vine, branches are almost completely indistinguishable from one another. It is impossible to determine where one branch ends and the other begins. All of them run together because they all grow out of the central vine. And what this image then suggests about community is that there are no freestanding individuals in our community, but there are branches that encircle each other completely. The fruitfulness of each individual branch then depends on its relationship to the vine and then with each other. John's point is that each individual is rooted in Jesus and hence gives up the individual status to become one of the many encircling branches. Most of us, if we think about it, can figure out who those people, those assistant vine growers were for each of us. We can look back over our lives and remember the people who have lived out the gospel, who acted like in a Christ-like manner in such a way that we wanted to be like them, wanted to be that sort of person, the kind of Christians that they were. That is who we're called to be. We are all called to be assistant vine growers, exposing people to the agape love of God in Christ. Now this morning we're going to bring two more into the community of Christ with the water of baptism and the prayers washing over them, filling them with God's holy and life-giving spirit. And we will mark them with holy oil reminding them and naming them that they are Christ's own forever. And when asked if we will support them in their faith journeys, if we will be assistant vine growers for them, well, you know what we're going to say. We will gladly say with great excitement and conviction, we will. Amen.